So a discussion about concepts. I think for people who are just entering the profession or just uh, entering school, it's it's kind of a, a weird idea, right? That a building would have a concept behind it. Um, and the specific term concept is kind of overused in architecture. I think it's misused many times. I think a lot of architects, designers, students, faculty members use the word concept when they don't really mean concept, when they really mean tactic, strategy, or simply... Ideas. Um, yeah, ideas or... Yeah, tactics and strategies most often is how I see it confused. Um, well, concept is an abstract idea, basically, right? And it's it's the idea that it, get real, it gets realized in some kind of way. I don't think that the discussion we're going to have is is going to be like a step step by step guide I wouldn't say that um, because the the big idea so so I think this discussion is, is gonna be more about like the big idea the intent the thesis the concept all those things is kind of what we're talking about right whether or not it's specifically called one thing or another I don't really care um, but I don't know if this would be a, a guide specifically because where that initial idea comes from is different for every person, different for every project, different for every, you know, day of the week that you're in. It, the inspiration for that, that kernel, that seed can come from anywhere. So it's a bit difficult to say, like, this is step one, and step two, and step three, and step four, now you have a concept. And now how you, this is how you realize the concept. You know what I mean? Well, I, let, me, let me back up. Let me ask you this. So in the United States, in most architecture schools, this is a known thing, an architectural concept. And it's pretty well known mostly that as a student, part of what you have to learn is how to come up with a concept and then how to execute it through your building. And then generally the critiques are basically, okay, here, this is your big idea, right? Do I think that idea is good, bad, you know, valid, incorrect, uh, erroneous, or whatever? And then now here's my building, which is the realization of that idea. It's, it's meant to express that idea, it's meant to achieve these things. And then the second part of the critique is, okay, well, I maybe I agree with your idea, but how you did it, that's not correct, right? You wanted to create a building that was meant to, meant, meant to I don't know, create a sense of community, and you created a prison, right? Um, so I think, like, the, that threshold between those two sides, the conceptual and the real, we could say, is something that's pretty common in architecture schools. Um, it's odd because I don't remember actually being ever told made it more in a direct like direct way what a concept is or, or even like the understanding was never really made clear it was, it was sort of like here's a bunch of assignments we're going to kind of talk about things and then slowly over five years you're going to figure it out or you don't and the reality is a lot of students don't figure out what that is really and i would say it's probably because most faculty members don't actually understand what that is and how it gets executed but in france in your education rather in your education um is that pretty accepted as as something that's part of the discussion? Oh, you just talk for like three minutes straight. That was impressive. Um, I mean, you know, from my memory, from my time in school, which now has been a while. Uh, yeah, I mean, having a concept was like you cannot start a project if you do not have one. Hmm. You you know, or you can't have a project without one, rather, right? Because you can start a project. Well, the thing is, at some point, you need a big idea to drive all of the ideas together. Otherwise, mm. you're just going to either start developing a building that doesn't look like anything or it doesn't rationalize like anything because there is nothing that ties the whole together. Um, so uh, I would think, yeah, every, every single project I did in school, it was pretty clear that you had at some point, not necessarily at the beginning, but you had to find your concept. Right, but were you guys were you taught how to do that, or was it like no? Because like you said, you know, there is not really like one way to find one. Yeah. It's kind of like you are looking for I don't know a, a needle in a in a haystack, right? And there is not really a, a better way to find it. You just have to just keep keep working and keep digging, and and eventually it would like come come up to your face, right? Right, right. I do think there's. Um, I do think there is techniques and methods you can employ to try and get to it faster, yeah. but the result isn't guaranteed. Right. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. No. What did you, what did you say? The last thing you said, just to re remind me before. I pick there up. is different methods that you right. can employ, but it doesn't necessarily guarantee the results. Yes, yes, yes. And that's a really good point. I think that's what makes design exciting and also scary every time you embark on that journey, because there is a uh, most often, generally, a sense of like the unknown and you might have a certain process which 
the further along you go in your career and in your experience, you start to develop a, a certain way of, of uh, going through the process that will, with a greater percentage of chance, like result in a good idea. But it's never guaranteed, you know. And I think also knowing, I think the fact that there is no guarantee is a really important thing because otherwise things become too prescriptive and predictable. Right. Yeah, and I, and I think it's like, you know, finding like the soulmate, right? Like the more you are expecting to find it, the actually the, the more difficulty you're giving yourself. And he oftentimes, like for me at least, like comes at the moment at which I expected the least. Oh, so it's Eureka kind of no, thing. No, but you know, yeah. it's like, it's like, or you would force a concept onto a project because you need one, you know? Yes. But yeah. really, uh, after what you realize that that was either the wrong concept or that actually wasn't a concept at all. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. And this is that's definitely something I, I agree with. And we were reminded of that uh, on a video clip uh, or, or from part of an interview we had with Tristan Eaton, the street mural artist. I made a video clip of it, so it's always kind of in my head. And he talks about that thing, that there are ideas and not all ideas are meant to be conveyed a certain way. So as an artist for him, it's like I have these ideas, but... You know, I can't force this idea to be executed um, through a certain medium in, right, in, in right. that discussion. The same thing applies uh, applies to architecture and architects. Like, it's a very dangerous thing when you start enforcing your own ideas onto projects that don't really it doesn't really work. Right. Right. And but I do think at the same time there are big concepts that exist within all of us because we all generally i mean all of us are human beings we do have a certain set of principles a way of thinking a philosophy that's within us that's what it means to be human and i think those find themselves find their ways into the work if you're good and if you're better than that even you recognize that they're finding their way into their work and you and you view it from a distance you say okay right. i have these things within me these tendencies they're showing up in my work right over a period of time um, now I have to kind of decide how much I'm going to allow that to be present in this next project. So I think certain big ideas can come up over and over again in different projects, and they should uh, as a way of working through things as a human. But uh, there are definitely, definitely limitations to that. Well, and I think also that, or you know, it, it makes... I think the the uniqueness of a concept is what makes it more or less successful. Like I agree that the concept could, the same concept could apply to different projects hmm. for different reasons, whatever the concept is. But to me, a concept is extremely successful when it is really was meant and is only meant for this specific project, because that means you found mm -hmm. like what makes the project the project. Yeah, I I, I think I can agree with that sort of i think the other dimension to it is i think if we're just talking about that one project you're totally right but the other dimension is time meaning that as the creator as the author as the architect as a designer you're going to do more and more projects so i think that's true but i think there's also because inherently there's going to be bias the therefore the project itself also has to somehow again wrestle with that idea of of your identity in the project <laughs> So yeah, you need to, and, I, and I think that's the biggest problem between, like, let's say, a concept that you develop in school versus a, pro a concept that you develop at work. Expand. Y you well, in school you have the luxury of time that you might not have at work, depending mm -hmm. on how fast the project you're working on is moving, or how much time you're investing on it. Right, like when you're in school, you're investing in your thing. You think about it all the time. If you work for an office, you might not be that invested, and you have multiple people on it. So then it becomes like. A, a team concept and not necessarily like a one-man show concept yeah. right so i think that you know distorts the concept a little much yeah 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 i, I think that's true to me chefs in the kitchen um i think that's the beauty of, of of you know having your own office or even in school is like there's a purity to it right and, and you're intentionally stripping down and stripping away a lot of thing a lot of reality right because it allows you the freedom to kind of, basically you're learning with training rules on in a certain way. And you have to because architecture is highly complex and difficult to to uh, actually happen, have happened in the real world, like really difficult. So well, you kind of need to, you kind of need to ignore all that stuff in order to kind of get your, your, your feet under you in a way. Um, but I think one of the other, I wanna get back to that, but one of the other um, issues that I see 
very often is again the misuse of certain ideas as architectural a, a, as a concept that's that drives a piece of architecture which is different from an architectural concept so in other words i think pretty often the way education happens is that like we're were taught about these concepts and basically we have to learn how they have formal implications meaning how do they get how they ha how they how they uh, shape uh you know mass how they shape shape right i have this concept how does it get re realized that that transition is a really difficult one to make so we start simple and there are kinds of concepts we learn like figure ground mass void i don't know what balance contrast hierarchy uh any of those principles right and i think very often they are called concepts, uh, which in some ways they, they are, they are abstract ideas. Um, but in the, in the realm and definition of like total architecture, true, truest architecture, those are not actual concepts. I think those are formal concepts when we first learned them is what I'm trying to say. Right. They're, so they're, 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 they're specific, theory. they're theory, but they're specific to, ha to form meaning shape and right. things. Right. And I think what happens is that's that's how we first learn. That's our those are our first steps because it's easy to get our minds wrapped around around that. It's not easy, but but we but a lot it's it's it works. Um, but then what happens is I think after that uh, a lot of students aren't able to kind of start to think bigger. So they take that same level of thinking and they apply it to a, a building. So like for example. One of the one of the things that I've seen many times in schools that I, I really have seen so many times that annoys me is like the concept of weaving. Have you heard this concept of weaving? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Or activating spaces. Yeah. 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 Or well, kind of, you well know. so you, you have to be careful with with well, activating spaces is a different thing, but weaving, right? Weaving as a way to do what? It's always about uniting different things or bringing people together and whatever because it's weaving. So that is, in many ways, uh, you could think of it as a formal concept, right? An actual weave of threads to create the fabric, right? And a lot of students, designers, not even students, but designers, architects, will take that idea, apply that as a formal concept or idea to the building. So now the building has these, let's say, strips, right? And the strips kind of interlock in, in section, of course. It happens in section because we need to have things happen in section. Because you uh, always produce amazing documents. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, when, in fact, the the weaving idea was meant to bring people together, but in actuality, if you look at the section and the drawings and what the building is doing, you're not bringing people together. You're actually isolating them into these strands across different spaces, right? Um, of course, I'm talking about a project that no one's seeing right now, but I think we we have all seen something like that, and that to me is a very classic example of like that is not. A, a concept for a project or maybe it could be but you're not understanding it correctly right because you're limiting it to a formal one that or like you were saying the 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 concept is loaded with a certain agenda to satisfy mm -hmm. right and like let's say they wanted to just do like a weavy right. form but then the concept is weave because you know like that's pretty obvious right but that's that's because they're already trying to influence the concept. The concept shouldn't be designed. The, the concept shouldn't be not designed, but you know what I mean? Like kind of like, w like what do I want the concept to be? The concept should be coming to you. Oh man, we are sense? getting conceptual. <laughs> no, say, it, say, it, no, say it again. Like you are not making up the concept. Uh, yeah. the, sh the concept should be coming to you. Right. Okay. Right. It's not like something that you you decide like, oh, I want the concept to be blue and have waves and have curves, and it it's not that. Mm -hmm. It it's it's bigger than that, and it's so obvious that it should be just coming to you. You shouldn't be like making it up. Well, perhaps this is another. This I goes. Mean, that's this, how I think about it. This though. is another example, of, like the transition between uh, years as a designer, right? And in the beginning, you're kind of force fed little tiny bits of concepts to learn how to right. execute them, understand them, like whatever. Um, but then later on, obviously, when you go to design a building, you there's not a teacher uh, in in reality, right, giving you a concept to work with. And even in school, there's there's a program, there's a site, yes, but well, okay, this gets into how teachers teach now. I'm not going to get into that. But but what should be the fact that you have this right, this set of documents, the program, the site, all that stuff, uh, but you don't know what to do. It's up to you to figure out, right? It should be that way. Um, and I think. 
that's the challenge. We, it's, I think the, the first part of the education, I don't know why we're talking about education, it's clear, but when we get to designing a building, we don't know what to do. So now we think, okay, well, let me just kind of pull something out of the air and shove it down on paper because what the fuck else am I supposed to do? I haven't been taught how to do this. Well, and I think that's also why it after a lot of times um, student projects aren't very good. I think <laughs> yeah. it's because a lot of students struggle in finding that concept and finding it on time to, you know, have enough time to produce whatever documents they're supposed to produce. And then they just basically like, you know, yeah. like grab onto something and mm -hmm. don't let go because it's like their last way to make it to the end. Yeah. Right. Because yeah. because the concept is so important. And according to, you know, schools and, 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 and teachers, which I can understand, but at the same time, does every single project need a concept? You know, I... And does, does, I, and, and what kind of concept, you yeah, know, yeah. is it a formal concept? Is it a social concept? Is it mm. a political concept? Like what kind of concept? Uh, okay. Let's, let's bookmark the second question and answer the first one, which was, Just uh, every a, project needs a concept. Okay. Let's bookmark the second question too, <laughs> and the third question and get to the first one, which was, you know, students have struggling, right. Or right. fresh designers struggling in a way. Um, so I think. I think you're right. There's the issue of like time and schedules and not getting work done and, and also just fucking laziness. Like Simpsons, you just need to sit down and produce, you know, I think. And that's the other thing too, that's interesting about the design process is that on the one hand, um, like you were saying, there's a mystery to it, right? You don't know, you're not guaranteed anything ever, no matter how good you are up here. You're not guaranteed anything ever. That's the def that's, that's, that's part of the definition of design, I think. Um, but that also means you you cannot just sit around and wait for something to happen. Like you were saying, the concept comes to you. I, I kind I get what you're saying. I well, agree it with comes that. to you, but you have to like go. For, but go you at have it, to. Right? You have to. It, yeah, 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 yeah. It's not it's, just gonna, it's, you're gonna sit and it's gonna come to you. You have to like go and look for it, and eventually it will like show up to you. Yeah, yeah. So, so you know, in in terms of like looking at a project in hindsight after it's completed. Uh, i.e. when you present a project, there should be a pretty clear progression of of of, uh, of things, right? So, um, like, I had this idea, right? It came about from this research or from whatever thing, right? And now how I execute it, and this is the result it produces. It's, it's linear in that sense. But in the process of designing, at least in the beginning phases, um, beginning phases of a project, it's not that clear. It's kind of like... Uh, it's not circular. It's kind of a squiggly line, right? The design process is not a straight line. It's also not uh, It's not a, a true zigzag, and it's also not just back and forth, back and forth. It's not a circle. It's kind of like a squiggly mess, but it still has direction, right? So, in the especially in the beginning, is chaos because you're kind of brainstorming a lot of different big ideas. But the chaos still has some kind of implied direction because ultimately you need to get to an end product. Um, what was I talking about? I don't know. <laughs> Why don't you know? <laughs> it's so hot. I was in the sun too long today. Now I'm really hot and sweaty. Uh, okay. Uh, so the development of a concept or, or finding one, right? It, 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 I, I do think it, it does come from within you, but I don't <laughs> think you're aware of that until you're a more mature designer. I think in the beginning phases and for all projects, it does come from a research process. So this actually reminds me of a conversation we had with Mike Piatok on a recent uh, episode. We we're talking about these little gestures that he does in his in his buildings, right? Um, and how these different gestures are directly have great meaning to the the users. Some of them were like tiny birdhouses. Others of them were significant portions of the building had, were shaped and and new almost new program was invented in, in a certain way because it responded to the research he did. So that conversation was about how you take specific ideas and how they get manifested in a project, either small things that get tacked on or things that are pretty integral to the building itself. Um, but the point is, is that those small ideas or the big idea for the project comes from a research process, right? And that's, I think, a very important thing. I think you have to have that research process um, because all projects exist, you know, with the site, they're located somewhere. There's a user group of some kind. There's a program of some kind that, that's the initial program that you that you have to kind of read, you know, adapt, change, add on to subtract from, et cetera. Um, and that's the, that's where you begin. That's the base. And if you do your research right, 
you will develop some kind of um yeah deeper analysis of the problems at hand right and yeah, that begins yeah. to have it doesn't it doesn't necessarily lead you, lead you to a concept but it starts to outline a direction a direction and and the 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 space that you're you're conceptually operating within i think and then eventually at some point after you kind of try stuff and go back and forth between um non-graphic i think exploration talking to people writing stuff down uh or doing graphic uh really sketchy diagrams to building design we could call it and you go back and forth back and forth then you start to realize okay there's actually a concept here that will help me address the issues i want to address and I think it's almost like you're doing your 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 due diligence before you come up with something, or the or you you go in one direction. Is that you always start by looking at like the site or or the program or whatever you're supposed to develop the project based upon at the very beginning, right? Mm -hmm. And you kind of do your your like you said like your research homework. Like you're going to observe very deeply like every single thing. You're gonna make analysis and conclusions and. And you know, like, like almost, like almost like a good detective work. Mm -hmm. So you get a very good understanding of what you are approaching, and then based on that, like ideas and things are going to reveal themselves and come up to you and lead you in a, on a track that would eventually lead you to the concept. Yes, and I think the key is that in this process, in the beginning phases, you need to be light on your feet, right? You need to right. be able to not not overly committed to one thing or not fall in love too much with one thing. And I think the challenge is that generally the way we're educated is that we build up our formal um, uh, experience and skill set. I wouldn't call it expertise, but skill set first, right? Because that's a new language. And then we're introduced to the research that we're kind of talking about. And we're not able to kind of bridge those two together. What do you mean does skill that, set? Does that, like, like, like when you're first starting off, you learn how to make, you know, little abstract model things and draw things and stuff. You're working on the formal skill set, right? Right. The graphic skill set. But there's a whole other skill set of knowing how to do research of a project. And, and when I say research, I don't mean, well, it, it would include going to the library and researching online and all that stuff, of course. But I don't mean research as, as in maybe... I mean design research, which I don't know how to explain that. Like, it is the research of a topic and a people and and a research of facts, yeah. But it's also the research of knowing how to weave those into a story. So I think your word, your so so what I'm saying is that I think those two sides are are certainly distinct in in some ways, and we develop those a lot of times differently at separate times in our careers, and we don't often try, we don't often learn how to bridge those two. Right, and that's where you get a, you get this area where you get you get designers who do uh, projects that are too heavily uh, based on let's say call it the research stuff, the data, right? The yeah, data, yeah. and there's no soul to it. It's there's no concept. It's just like a know, plus b equals c. Exactly and right. That's yeah. Uh, and then you get stuff where it's like oh, banana is my concept, and this is a movie theater, so it's banana shape. And you're like, what the fuck does that have to do with a movie theater? You're like, well, right. films came from banana leaves and or whatever bullshit. That <laughs> is it true? I don't know. I I have a lot of anger toward people who do that kind of stuff. I'm like, the fuck out of here. Um, so you have these two sides, and I think that's part part right, maybe that's maybe why because we don't actually develop them simultaneously, which is because it's too difficult for whatever reason. Um, but the use of the word detective, the word that you said, I think is 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 actually something that I use in one of the studios I taught to kind of get students to kind of think a certain way. Um, that studio, it was an urban scale project. Uh, the, the design process concept and all the things we were talking about applies both to architecture um, and urban design and probably interior design as well and all different scales. But detective, right? It's the idea that you, uh, in the case of an urban design project, right, it was a larger scale and you're not dealing so much with specific tectonics you're doing more with kind of planning we could say but it's the same principles of you have a site you have a context you're operating within you have a people you're dealing with and 
the way I like to, like to think about it is that you are doing detective work. You have to research all these different things, all these different factors, the political climate, social climate, the architectural, everything that's going on, all these factors, and you have to kind of imagine that you put them on a wall, much like a detective would in the movies, and you start to draw connections between things. And you say, okay, there's something significant in this stew of, of stuff that I have. Right now, because I'm starting off, it's just miscellaneous ingredients and miscellaneous things. I don't know... I don't know what, what's happening. I don't know where up and down is. There's no hierarchy. There's no structure. I, I, I don't know. But there, I know there's something here. And it's your job to then structure that information and weave it together and put red lines between them and whatever to figure out what are the key players, the key elements, the key, key factors, how those relate. And that begins to outline the problem, the, the primary, the fundamental problem that you're dealing with in this scene. Right. The, the story the story right, right, right. and right. i do think about design as problem solving uh which might be kind of old school for some people i think it was eisenman who said it might have been eisenman or someone else saying like Arch architects don't problem solve like what problems do they solve well you know <laughs> you, I, you, like bathroom problems i mean it is a profession of problem solving because that's what you're doing all the time but you could also argue that a lot of other things are basically just problem solving. You're always problem solving. Well, and things. then also aren't we solving the problems that we created? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true too. But is it, it is an exercise at least of problem solving. A lot of it, yeah. So, I mean, it, it, it's, it's problem solving in the sense that like you're, you hope that your building is going to contribute to the betterment of mankind, right? So if it's a betterment, then you're fixing, you're improving on something, right? And that's, and the thing that you, you are proving on, you would say either was in a negative, was a problem, or if it's not in the negative, it's still you're bettering it. So in some ways, by definition, it is understood as a problem because you're going to be fixing it or changing it, right? Um, so that's why it's problem solving. So I think for me, that research is, is really important because it it sets up the before. It sets up all yeah. the, 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 the pitch. I think it's important. The only thing I feel like sometimes it's a little too reassuring to just stick to it mm -hmm. and not try and move to the next step after the research yes you know like there is fascination of like doing research and like you know discovering things and all of that or the the fear of stepping out of that safe research phase because really you're just collecting looking observing and making conclusion but you're not really involving yourself or making decisions yet you know well, th yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so I would say, you know, the, the the research phase is a phase and you need to get out of it at some point. Yeah, yeah. No, you absolutely do. And this is the thing. This is this this is the bridge between the research and the I call it design, right? You, you uh, obviously it's not like I do all my research for the first 10 days. Now I'm done. Now it's design time. You have to go back and forth between the two, right, to advance. So there's kind of an intermediate step where right. you are in flux. Um, and, and that's the big question is how do you take this research and transla translate it into form, into architectural understanding, right? Not, pro not, not solutions yet, but you need to kind of like form formalize, architecturalize the research you're doing. So if I have a student who comes up and is like, okay, like uh, doing this building for these people, the demographic is 60% that, 20% that, 10% that, 5%, uh, 25 2.5%, right? That should be 100, I don't know. And that's what it is, right? So therefore, yada, yada, yada. Or, uh, but then I'm like, okay, that's great. But how does this impact, how does this have formal implications, right? So there's the ex there is the exercise of taking research that on the face of it is just words, numbers, and emotions and figure out how that relates to the built environment, to the physical structures around us. That's a difficult thing to do, but that's part of the analysis, and that's part of how you bridge the gap between research and ultimately designing something, right? So and so people, uh, they ha they have a sense of they, there's there's a community um, that exists, right? There's a sense of social gathering that exists. Okay, that's great. How how does the built environment relate to that? Oh, they use space a certain way. There's a courtyard that's done in a, in a, in a certain manner. Okay, that becomes 
food ingredients for your design. It becomes stepping stones for your design. But unless stepping you have stones, that, that's the thing, stones, right? Yeah. Like you don't want to start designing like a bunch of formal thing that responds to the result and conclusion you made from your research, because then you just end up with a patchwork of like mini concepts that don't necessarily relate to each other, right? Mm. I think it's important to, when you do your research, to start thinking about how you would translate those ideas into a formal uh, conclusion or, or, or design. But ultimately, you're still looking for the big, the big idea, right? Like you don't want to start getting too much in the detail of those small gesture, because at the end, the big idea is what makes everything cohesive. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, having them on a post-it note somewhere so you don't forget about it, fine. But you always have to look at them together and make sure that they they, they work as a whole, right? Yeah, you know, absolutely. Then this goes back to the idea to do... I mean, it's a story. It's a, it's a news article. If you're the, if you're the detective, the, the journalist, right, you're writing a news article, you can't just be like, okay, I did my research, you know, reader, audience, public... Here's fact one, fact two, or fact three, and fact four, and fact, and then you're like, okay, but what does that have to do with anything? How do these things relate? Like, what's the big takeaway? Oh, I don't know. It's just a bunch of facts. It, same thing right, as you're saying right, in design. Right. You, you can't. I mean, I think at some point, it, it could be argued that for some projects that's a reasonable approach. But kind of that aside, those specific projects, I, I think yeah, you do need a, an overall kind of theme. And let's go. This is another important, uh, I think, thing to realize as a designer is that not not all ideas are equal and ideas have to be given hierarchy so like you have ideas that you come up with that are your biases you have ideas that you come across from your research and i guess like they're all floating around kind of in a mess you have to give them order you have to know which ones are at the top and which ones are below that and you create chapters of ideas and eventually as you work through you will realize that pretty much everything you came across falls into its own place where it belongs because at the top of your conceptual outline of ideas there is a big idea and that's the way it works that's the, that's the way that you can have a, a design that's coherent right um and i think that's a really important exercise so like for me personally um that's always something i think about um either i do or i think about depending on the scope of the project is that outline uh, because I have too many ideas, as as do most people and designers, and we don't know how to control oh them. God, you, do. you have to put them down. You have to recognize that they have to be given order. You have to also recognize that not all of them will fit in this project. You might come across something that emotionally, you know, instinctually, you're like, oh, I really like this. There's something there. But you have to know and be mature enough to say, yeah, well, maybe it actually doesn't work with this project because this project is a certain story. It doesn't belong in the story. Save it for the next one, right? And that's tough to do when you're younger, I think. But um, that's part of the that's part of it. You know, you, you have to structure structure the ideas. So going back to my question, do you think yeah. every project, every building, needs a concept? Well, I do believe that design is problem solving, and like I said, so there's a problem and a solution. I think if you solve the problem, that's it. You, you're you're pretty much completed. I mean, that's so a, the concept is the good. cherry the cherry on top. The con do you need a concept though to solve the problem? It's a good question. Um I don't think you always do. I don't like, think you I always don't know, need a concept. You have a factory building. Yeah. Does the factory building needs to have a concept as long as it serves its final purpose to what it was designed for? Well this goes this goes back, I think, to um not back. This goes to something I want to talk about, which is I don't think a lot of designers actually understand what problem means. I think uh I think that most designers think about the problem on a surface level and therefore they don't, f and because of that, they don't have enough, the re their research doesn't give them enough juice to propel them forward to have an interesting solution. So therefore they, they, they don't believe in the idea of problem solving or they start throwing in random conceptual stuff out of nowhere because they have nothing else to kind of like, you know, power the design process and the design, right? Well, it's it's not it's not because it's not because oh I'm doing this kind of building in this place and there's not enough for me to do so I have to start throwing in random stuff. No, that's not the case. It's you didn't do your research well enough, right? And I don't mean research in terms of like discovering new facts like Aaron Brockovich. I mean research in that you you're not you're not thinking deeper. You're not thinking you're not thinking conceptually in the research process, 
right? So an example I would use, to, uh, I mean, would be, I'll just use my own projects because it's it's easiest and whatever. Um, at one point in my student career, I had to design a homeless shelter. And everyone had to, in the studio had to do a homeless shelter. It was a studio project. And uh, there were a lot of problems with a homeless shelter. It's a good example of, of a lot of different problems. You got security, you got uh, you got safe, safety, security, kind of the same thing. You have to, uh, sanitation is, is a problem. Along with security, you have eyesight, right? You have funding is potentially a problem. Um, I don't know. There's a number of, of, of elements uh, that happen within a... A homeless shelter that make the project difficult right if you were a student and you answered just one of those in your design and that became your idea you failed right I'm answering security okay you've designed a jail right it doesn't work um, I don't know what I was what I'm talking about now oh yeah people not thinking conceptually in their research right or digging deeper in the research process so uh, the project for me at that time I thought well you know the the real the bigger problem that exists on top of all these smaller ones right is the fact that it, the, the bigger idea rather is that the homeless shelter really need is a, is a rehab, rehabilitation center they have to be rehabilitated that's part of what's supposed to happen homeless shelter if you provide, provide just security well that's a jail safety well you're just kind of like storing them in a place that's like good for now kind of thing but the real problem is like how do you how do you design a shelter to help these people progress so they can get back into society Right, that statement trumps all the other ones. All the other ones of security, safety, so whatever else fall underneath that. Right, the sub chapters. There's sub the exactly. Yeah. So the specific idea that I had was like, well, if eventually it's to get them back into society, it seems like right now, uh, when they are homeless and out in the streets, that they are used to living in public spaces in a certain way. On the side, on this, on the edge of the sidewalks, you know, not having any privacy. They don't have a regular sleep schedule. Their entire way of interacting with the normal built environment is totally uh, atypical, right? So then I thought, well, maybe the homeless shelter should, in a way, actually uh, create a, a microcosm or a small, a smaller environment where they could practice being citizens in public space in their own public spaces in a safe environment right where they feel comfortable before going back out into the real world so that kind of does that make sense what i'm saying yeah sort of so the building becomes uh sets up a number of spaces to allow them to again like i said practice being uh in open spaces practice practice kind of getting into the routine of of quote unquote normal life I'm not going to get into the question of, of should we be forcing the homeless to to conform to society? I'm not going to get into that because I don't want to. But so that that led to a number of things that meant, okay, we're sort of designed so that we need to have public spaces. We have spaces that feel like they're open, feel like they're public spaces. We need to have, um, you know, there are areas for kind of shops for them to kind of uh, to work at and to train themselves in, right? But the shops should be done in a way so that they can uh, basically rotate, role, role play and act as shopkeepers within the small society that they have, the, the homeless shelter, right? Their housing is not like a bunch of dormitory stuff. Their housing has different levels to it, meaning that there's some that kind of recreate right, what it's right. going to be like. So there's a public and public and private that's established. So anyway, but all that stuff stems from the idea that the shelter is a, is a, is a, a process for, for rehabilitation and that I'm going to create an architecture that helps them do that. So the built environment is a kind of practice template for them to go through. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah. So the so the point being, though, that that idea is bigger than the others. Right. And you wouldn't necessarily I don't think arriving at at the at the proposal of an art of a homeless shelter as a piece of architecture being a kind of practice run is the first thing that most people would think of. And it's it's you I, you would only get there if you kind of approach the problem and the research more conceptually, if you kind of went a little bit further down. Right. If you stopped at the problem of security weak architecture or you're going to kind of jump ship and start throwing in random stuff because you have nothing else to feed the design right does that make sense mm -hmm. so it's like when when a designer is struggling with executing executing their their project in the process of it usually it's like okay take one step back or two steps or three steps back and take a look at what you're trying your you're, you're building your design off of the research right Weak research, weak design. That's just what it is. Actually, Anne Fusion, who by now her interview will have come out, said something very similar to it. Um, but yeah, yeah. Go for it. Well, does do all projects need a concept? 
I don't know, but I think uh, in terms of trading, I think everyone should strive to have a concept. It keeps you in check as a designer, I feel. I would say that... Like, not every building needs a concept, but I feel like if you're hired as an architect to design a building, people are expecting more from you than just solving a basic problem. Yeah. Because you have the ability of, of synthesizing things together, like understanding at a bigger level than they are able to. You know, I think like you were saying, you know, like security, safety, and, and, and hygiene, and all of that stuff, like... People don't understand and know solutions to those things, right? What they don't understand is how you make the whole project successful and coherent. And, and you bring something that maybe the team that hired you for didn't even think about, didn't even know about, right? Yep. Like what, what magic can you give the project based on your architect knowledge and, and abilities, right? Right, right. Um, yeah, no, I, I, and I think oftentimes, the, you know, like the buildings or the project that people are extremely happy or, or satisfied or are extremely successful by the people who occupy those buildings is because they, they learn something about their own building. They discover the concept. There is something else that they were not expecting to get that they yeah. were able to get. Yeah. And, and in that sense, I don't think it's, it's mandatory to have it. But I think as an architect, it's kind of what you should be striving for. What you for. should be—that's yeah. that's what you should be aiming for, right? Yeah. Like, well, I, I do think also that um, going off of that uh, and the idea of problem solving is that the or asking questions, right? The architect's job is not just to answer the questions that the client gives or the program gives; it's to create the question, it's to ask the right question, is to figure out figure out what the problem is. So. Uh, and a, a lot of architects and designers have said this. It's, it's the your first job is to figure out what the problem is, right? What is it I'm dealing with? And then, like in the journalist's case, that's basically all his job is. And he stops there because he just his job is to just publish it. Right. But the architect now has to produce something in response to that context, i.e., a solution. Um, so that's that's the tricky thing. You have to get down to the bigger question that's that's so, that's there, and in a way. The, the reason why I think I would call that all of that process research is because I think the problem, it, it is there, you just need to find it. Right. Maybe the problem that you'd end up defining is a product of what's there, external from you and also yourself, but still it's, it exists somehow conceptually in space. It's just a matter of getting deep enough down and knowing how to, to connect the right dots and 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 being aware of your bias to, to determine it, right? And that's not an easy thing to do. So so then the, I suppose the question is like, how do you know when you've gone deep enough or when you get to that big question? Well, terms like basic, yeah, that's a good term to describe if you if you've not if you're not there yet, something really basic. If they if it's almost like if the answer is, is really obvious based on the question, yeah. then it's probably not it. Like there's two plus two equals four. If 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 that's if two plus two is your research, probably haven't gone far enough. You can kind of feel it. Um, I think it's also a matter of when the problem that you've outlined begins to exist at the intersection has implications for the for social things, has social pol implications, political implications, and uh, formal implications. Right, a good. A uh, robust problem and therefore concept and therefore project will engage in all of these ways. Weak ones, and this is actually a really easy way to, to see when a project is weak. Weak ones right. will only do one of those three things. Weak projects that are only social, you got some students that says, Oh, from our presentation, let's all hold hands. It's about community. They have some bitch ass model, meaning like poor model. And it's like, okay, because you're only focusing on this one thing, you're not focusing on the other. To it, and you're missing the one that's most important in a way, which is the architecture, or ones that are only architectural, only formal, and they don't have anything else. We concept. We all know architecture exists at the intersection of all these things. Why do we not critique it this way when it comes to projects? 
Well, one reason, to answer my own question, sorry, one reason, <laughs> one reason is that because in education, you know, you have to give students a pass because it's it's the doing of it, it's the learning of the process, but, but in the end, it's all of them. But I think, you know, once you get in the real world and you have, I don't know, uh, let's, let's, let's pick a developer because why not, right? Mm. They're always evil and, and sharks and whatever. You know, like you come up with a formal concept that wins your client developer. Like you got a strong concept and that's like amazing. But that's that's a lie. That's just a big lie. That's just a big shortcut, right? That satisfy one level of the whole project and and to me that's that, that that's just that's lazy. That's not you haven't done your homework, you haven't done your research. Well, if you're working with a develop developer, well, the whole like story, you know, but... constraints in the world you operate within is is just it's but that's so a, different. But that's something else, you know. Like in the once you work for an office and you have a client, a developer, a, um, an individual, a group, an organization, right? Well, doing that research takes time, and yeah. the client wants to see results. So, how do you not sacrifice <laughs> the concept? because of you know your client's expectation how do you justify the time you spend doing your research to find a concept to a client how do you justify the billable time you're charging them for you know i mean this is where i think for architecture to be to operate at the level that we're describe we were describing about you're basically talking about invention right as opposed to what most people and invention versus like building design is one way you could delineate it if to the general public, building design means like, yeah, you draw doors and windows and stuff, you make it look pretty. Like, what's what else is there? But if you answer the question of why should it look this way, is, meaning why and at a human level, right? Why in the cosmos do we exist? Why should a building exist? Well, there's another, there's all kinds of other questions we have to ask. If you're just talking about why does it look, look, look this way in terms of aesthetics, well, we can point to, can break something down aesthetically and say, you know, kind of certain principles that make something nice or not nice but i mean all of the offices that you've been exposed to directly or indirectly how often out of out of out of all the projects you come across how many of them actually have like a conceptual spine to them like a pro like an act like in the terms that we're in the way that we're talking about uh, you know uh, across all those three factors the social political and the what and the formal well, it's it's very difficult. It's very not not very many. I yeah. mean, I would say that I've seen concepts on like the interior design level that are more like aesthetic concepts, mm -hmm. you know, like like visual, like sensible concepts, and then you know things that are more functional concept. But again, it's 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 oftentimes focusing on one layer of the project and not so much on all the layers of the projects. Um, because it it is it is it's 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 more complex well it's because th basically you know there's there's actually there's money involved <laughs> well, no that's true <laughs> you're designing true. on and you can dream up anything and, and then successful offices you know sometimes they find like you said they have things that they are interested about right or that they realize that after doing 30 projects there is always the same thing that comes back to them and they just know really well how to tailor them to make them concept for those projects that they work on right right but that's where, to me, there is an issue there. It's because you're applying your own agenda on what you want the concept of the project to be focusing on, which really, I'm not saying it's a bad thing. Like oftentimes, you know, it starts with very good intentions and it's 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 a good direction. But because you started guiding it from before doing your research, to me, you kind of force the research. I hear what you're saying. You know, like you're tailoring the results so it goes in the way you want it to go. Yeah. I think it depends on how it's done. I could understand it if you're running a business, you know, you want to be successful and keep, you know, keep carrying on without reinventing the wheel every time, which makes sense. But if you're really, truly looking for like the concept for that one project, I don't think you can objectively get it. I think there are different layers or different levels of concepts. Like there's really, really big or base ones, you know. And there's ones that are much smaller and, and closer to the surface. I think it only becomes a problem when the more surface ones start to happen across different projects, right? Superficial, you could call it, I suppose. 
Because I do think like for a lot of designers, and that's a career is design, you know, a career. Um, there's some really the kind of fundamental like base, almost like way, way, way subsurface things that they're that that continually pop up either subconsciously or consciously even. Um, but I don't think at that level down there it's a problem because there's enough space between that deep conceptual level and the surface of the surface being the final execution. So where it's not a problem, but there's something that they're wrestling with further inside at some point. It'll make its way to the surface and become crystallized. But I think it is an issue, and I would agree, it's an issue when, uh, you know, basically when things start looking the same. I think then it's like, why? I don't understand. Yeah. An aesthetic concept is a weird thing, to be honest. Because when I talk about concept, and the way we talked about concept in the first part of the conversation, was not really so much about aesthetics as it was about as it was as it was about hmm. well the concept that it's applied for everything you know that, that's i think to me how you like validate the concept like the final one right like you right. said like you're like concept of marshmallow okay well the window does the concept of marshmallow ap applies to my windows well right. not really does the concept of marshmallow apply to my side plan well not really you know <laughs> like you know what i mean like it's not it's, really. it's that's kind of how you like you test yeah. it and you vet and you validate it right? right like if if it doesn't work uh, you missed a step somewhere you missed something right but then that also brings me to the next point, which is I think you can change concept along the way in a project. And I think mm -hmm. oftentimes students or even like professionals are afraid to kind of reroute the project's direction, even if they know inside that, you know, that actually is my, is the concept. What I was looking at before was not it, yeah. you know? And, and well, you know, it's, it's, it's tricky. Like sometimes you have to like, restart from zero to get it right yeah but uh most of the times it's it's worth it yeah i it's that's that's a tough one um especially as someone who struggles with completing things on time because there is the urge i think to to find the best to do the best if you're competitive well, and, then, and then there is that it's like are you looking for the best for the project or are you just looking for the best for yourself and at that point it's like mm. does it matter if it's for yourself well, I, I think um, I think there's just yeah. At some point, you have to recognize that you're not going to be able to create the best because there's not enough time, and that you wait, have wait, to wait, say just say that again. Uh, we are recording this. <laughs> yeah, and you have to, and you have to. I mean, this this other things maybe, but the, the project doesn't matter unless it's complete. And that's just the reality of it. This goes back to why competitions are a good idea. Like, it doesn't make fucking difference if it's not done. Um, and you have to kind of just recognize that some of these things you're trying to resolve. The thing is, the, the, the rabbit hole never ends. The further down you go, the deeper you go, the more you realize, like, oh, I'm getting somewhere good. But you have to stop at some point to get yourself back up. Yeah, the one and you who have says to, that. And you oh have my to, god, I'm gonna play this recording every day. Do you know why I think I could? I I I am potentially a good teacher is because I was a terrible student. That applies. So you're gonna be a great boss because you were a terrible employee. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I was, I was I was an okay employee. Um, but so you so that you have to recognize that 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 the rabbit hole doesn't end and you have to come back up out of the to, to complete the thing and you have to just remember where you left off and know that you're going to pick up those problems again and sometimes some projects don't allow you to go that deep that's why you go from bachelor's to master's to phd to your own office or whatever it is like you 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 have to I don't know. It's a, it's a larger perspective you have to have. You, yeah, you have to put yourself back in the context in which you belong, right? And that, that, at some point, it's like, where is this going? But I know? do think. But I do think the idea that, um, like you were saying, that's the, it's the it's the mark of a good concept. You know, it's a good concept if it applies to pretty much everything in a project. That's how you know it's the statement, right? If it doesn't, okay. First of all, let me say that's very, very, very difficult to do. Extremely difficult to do, especially if you're talking about 
designing actual buildings where there's detailing oh, yeah. and stuff like, like how do you take a abstract thing and apply that to an abstract idea that's not just a formal one apply that to like window details oh, oh, oh. Yeah, that's a whole different uh problem that you have to wrestle with once you after you graduate because when you're in school when, when you're a younger designer or you're like one of these fashionable designers just does big gestures uh the concept get up gets applied in a big big gesture way okay but that's that, that is superficial at some point because architecture is a human scale, uh, you know, creation. Okay, so what is, what about the other ways that we test architecture? What is it like to be in the space? What is the what is the detailing right? Why is it why is the room this big or that big? Why is it this kind of furniture? What dictates the kind of furniture? All of those things have to somehow answer back to the big idea. But a lot of these more conceptual, I don't know what uh, desirable design offices, right? Big idea, big gesture. That's it. Okay, yeah, but that's not architecture. And then the other end, you have architects who do really nice detailing, but somehow you get the feeling that maybe they're missing the more conceptual thinking. Anyway, but that that is the hallmark. That is the the one of the key uh, factors or, or marks of a good concept is when you know that it applies all the way throughout. I think I did that for my thesis actually. I think I did like month and month of work, and then at some point one day I was like. Bingo! I was not going in the right direction. Oh, really? I just restart everything. Yeah, it was kind of scary because you're like, well, I spent all of this time and did all of this work, and now I'm basically gonna, you know, redo it all. So what was it? Oh, I don't remember. <laughs> I don't. I don't remember. I wouldn't even want to talk about it. But, but I think it's also about being objective in the research and and being honest. You know when you're you're kind of shortcutting things, you like you know just get it done with, or you know when you haven't looked at things long enough to really understand it, or, or you when know, you fall in love with something, or you know when you're just being obsessed with that idea, but really doesn't doesn't even make sense for that project, you know. And I think it's, you know, I think uh, that. that and that's why I think it's a it, sometimes it's a personal process, but also like talking to other people about it and the way you explain your concept is also a way to test it, right? Like if you can say more than two words on it, well, that might not be it. Yeah, I don't know. Talking to people, I don't. <laughs> it's a matter of trust. Talk to your mom. I, I mean, trust yeah. a lot of people. <laughs> I think. Um, I think the other thing too is. Uh, I, I think some of the big big um, concepts are really can be applied to different projects. That's also maybe why, to answering your other earlier question, I think it's okay for some offices to kind of repeat concepts when they're really far down. So like, like hybridity is a concept, right? I mean, weaving could be a concept too, although it's kind of overdone. Maybe hybridity is too, but hybridity could be a concept, but it could be executed, applied, and thought about. In so many, so many different ways, but I, I think it's that kind of, and this is where I think diagramming and conceptual oh, diagrams are really important because those, those are they, they, they are the bridge between that research that that is strictly you know numbers and facts and emotion and all that kind of and words, to eventual architectural architectural understanding at least is the diagram, that is. Well, no, it's a way to organize your thoughts and understand what what you're looking at. Yeah, you know. But I think it's also important to remember that, that those are only diagrams, and the direct translation, sometimes, or rather, the translation that's made too early of those uh, early diagrams to building form, is uh, risky and a bit short sighted again. Um, but I think the the diagrams are important because those become like kind of the the formal ingredients in a sense but the jump from the really basic diagram so let's say you have a diagram that depicts contrast right um the jump from that to building again you just you can't make it so so you can't make it without thought you know so I, I don't know. I don't know how to explain it, but but there's different levels of conceptual diagrams, and I think you have to be aware of the fundamental ones, but you also have to recognize that there's a long process between that and the final forms of whatever the building is. But then, in the other end, I think some you know, like we said, like well, you kind of have to test the concept by trying to apply it to every single layer of your project to see if it's really embedded in in everything, right? That's the ultimate 
you know realization of the concept and that's that's also how you realize that your concept is not it and that you have to get something bigger right to apply in the same time if you found the concept and now you start designing and you try to apply everything to fit your concept in a way i think you can make yourself like almost hostage or prisoner of the concept i agree um and that's a very difficult like gymnastics and balance to figure out like during the process is not to just think of everything through the eyes of the concept but be able to step in and out and going back and forth and sometimes forgetting about it and coming back to it um again you know like it like i think like you could hold on to it like you're like you're like your floaties mm -hmm. and and at some point you just have to kind of let go and it's a back and forth i feel like the design process well, and I, i think this this also is is a good example of why I think honesty is the most important thing to have in design. I think a I lot of people that. actually know um, when something is right or wrong in the design, but they just aren't being honest with themselves. They're allowing themselves to to lie to themselves and say like, oh, man, "This this this could work." It's like, yeah, but not, but does it? It doesn't work, <laughs> you know. And there, and I do believe there are some cases where they're hopeless, where they think it does work, and like, okay, well. <laughs> I'm not gonna waste my time with you. I got other people to focus on. <laughs> I, don't, I don't care. Why I'm not a full-time teacher? Okay. <laughs> you know what I mean? Or you're lazy. If you're lazy, fuck you. I'm not gonna deal with you. You have to inspire. No, I don't. He's lazy. Someone else inspire him. <laughs> fuck that kid. He's lazy and he's an asshole, right? <laughs> All right. This I see you. Gonna switch into I therapy you. time. <laughs> <laughs> I know you. You you were just like that kid I knew back when I was in school. Fuck you. I'm not gonna help you. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's okay, true. You just have your, you just I, I think, your job I think, offer as a teacher right there. <laughs> I think we need more of that, though. Generally speaking, I think there's a lot of like this kind of oh, help everyone, but you know what? It, well, to be honest, I feel like with you know the whole virus going on, everyone's going to be even more vanilla than before. Oh, God, I hope not. Because we're all going through tough times, and we have to like you know bring each other up and make each other feel better, however ways we can. Which you know it's it's not a bad intention, but uh, it, there, there's a place and time for all those things. And you know the other thing about design and, and and concepts and all these things is that I think it's interesting to to you were saying being being objective in the process. I think it's fascinating to think that in this design process you can be so objective that actually crazy ideas that on paper would make no sense would now make total sense given the research you've done given the problem that you've outlined and i think actually forcing yourself to create a concept that in many ways defies reality and maybe itself doesn't make sense in the end but does make sense per a specific set of research you did is a very important thing to go through. Super important thing, actually, as a way to force distance between you and the project, as a way to force objectivity to realize that, hey, there's this train, th there is this process, there's this train of thought that exists. And if I force myself to be objective, I'm going to end up somewhere and it's almost on its own kind of thing. And what's also nice about forcing yourself to do that forcing to end up at a conclusion that you would never want is now you're thinking truly outside of your own self. You're flexing the muscles of like being able to, to explore different ideas that you wouldn't do because you're, you're operating totally outside of your own bias or even what would make sense, period. Right. Or well, you have to feel com comfortable taking the risk though. Comfortable taking the risk. And this is where also I think there's a great freedom to saying that this is one of many projects especially if the project is not going to be done. Like one of the worst things that I see for conceptual projects, meaning projects that aren't, are not going to get built, but perhaps ones that still could be built, um, is that you start placing all these limitations. I couldn't, can't afford that, right? No, well, whatever make-believe client won't, won't do that. Well, this doesn't make sense. Like that material probably won't work. What the fuck are you thinking about that stuff, right? It's, it's, it's the projects that, 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 that won't be built have to be pushing that boundary otherwise they do lose their validity then what's the point of doing it well this brings me back to something we're designing right now that you've designed <laughs> i don't remember uh, or a certain display of some oh, yeah. sort that you yeah know, man that 
that fights the rules of gravity. Yeah. <laughs> Well, we'll see if that but, actually but, can be you realized. Know, uh, for the record, it, it, it can be built, uh, and an engineer says it can be built according to the dimensions I drew. So no, I, no, no, I'm according to the dimensions I drew. People do the work for me. I'm just here for the big ideas. People figure their shit out. Um, what was I saying before that? I don't know. No, 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 no. It was about... Uh, the, oh, yeah, like, yeah. Like so, going risky on the research. Uh, yeah, so there's actually a, a, a funny example Um that someone else came up with, but I think it's good. And I might have said it on here a long time ago. I don't, I don't recall. Um, and I use it when I talk to students because sometimes they, the question of concept comes up, especially in later later years if they don't know how to come up with one. They're <laughs> like, what the fuck? Like so far it's just been, you know, me following the rules, connecting the dots and I get an A, but now you're saying like, I don't have to connect the dots or something else. What do I do? Um, as an example of a project and a concept, which is totally outrageous, but it, it works uh, in a certain sense. So let's say you're tasked with designing, I think I've told you this, you're tasked with designing an elementary school. Okay. Mm -hmm. Another situation of what are the problems? Well, there's, well, now, now there's safety. <laughs> safety is a big concern. There's safety, you know, and then uh, we, I don't know what it's like in the eastern parts of the world, but in the western parts, okay, there's probably a playground because kids, you know, they have a snack break, a lunch break, and they have to line up. We begin the classes, and the classrooms have to have good daylight. The desks have to be certain dimensions and hallways, whatever, bath. Okay, yeah, that's all that stuff. But that, as we were saying, that's basic. That's not the problem. That's just a bunch of tiny problems that get solved. Those are well, those that's are program. That's some concept. Those are programs, not concept. Those are two plus two equal four, right? It's nothing any more than that. But if you define an elementary school and you say the problem really is, or rather what an elementary school should be, is to teach kids about life, to understand what life is. That's what an elementary school is meant to be about. That's a really big question, much bigger than like, yeah, we need to have good daylight, whatever bullshit, no, oh, sustainable energy, whatever nonsense, right? And you say, well, the best way for a kid of that age to learn about life is to learn about death. Right. So where is this going? This project also happens to be located in a in a part of the the nation where uh, you know meat is a big farming is a big oh, part of, no. of life. Right. <laughs> um, I mean, actually, it makes sense. You know, kids grow up, grow up on farms. They learn about life. Right. Kids in cities don't learn about life. Okay. Now this project is in a city. You want to teach death. kids about city. life and death is yin and yang, the light and the dark. So therefore, I'm going to place the local slaughterhouse right next oh to the elementary school. <laughs> And I'm going to put a giant glass curtain wall right down the middle between these two sides. And they're going to be right against each other, but have this glass wall between them. And so as kids are going through school, as they evolve, they see the life and death of the meat being slaughtered. And blood is going to splatter against the wall, the glass wall, and streak down. And kids will learn about life and death. I think now, they're going to learn about becoming vegan. That's what they're going to be learning about. <laughs> now... There are a myriad of problems with that solution that make it a terrible idea. But it's an exercise in thinking about a school in a different way and almost dreaming and role playing and saying, okay, this is one possible way to teach them about life is through death. And then I think that is one of the advantages of being connected to the things that we eat. 100% certain. It's the same principle as I want kids to learn about food. We're going to grow fucking tomatoes or whatever the fuck. The same thing applies to for meats that we're going to farm, raise, and yeah, eat. Well, so why wouldn't you show them that? Well, no, okay. Well, no, you don't want to show them that. But you could like, use plants to show them life and death. That's Why would you do that to a plant? Uh, I mean, a tomato plant eventually is going to die. So, you know, you could show it like sprouting Not the same and thing. then like dying. Not the same thing. You have blood I want, and blood baths. I and want little Timmy and... to understand that if he goes <laughs> in the street, doesn't look left and right, a car hits him, he will look like that fucking cow we just slaughtered, right? Again, it's not far from a certain reality some people grow up in if you grow up on a farm. And there are advantages to growing up in that scenario. And there's an understanding about life that happens and appreciation for things that happens. So, in a way, you can say that is the foundation of the approach and maybe the final execution needs to be slightly different, but it's potentially on the right path, right? Yeah, or you just do some kind of program, summer program where you switch farm kids with uh, yeah. urban kids and it, then it, they it, don't need starter houses. <laughs> I like that example because well, it's funny. People laugh at it. Um, and because I think it's easy to find the problems with it, but which also means, therefore, it's harder to think about, like, wait, can I stretch my brain so far where I could actually say, okay, 
I see the logic behind it, right? And um, that's all it asks for, that, that, that example. That's all it asks for. Well, I think you can stretch things, uh, you know, without having to go in like the violent and gory um, realm. <laughs> I don't, you know, I don't think that's a necessity. <laughs> I think you can like, I don't know, think of like, well, what if there is no gravity or, or what is, you know, a school that had no roof? What would that mean? You know, like, what, uh, like what you know what I mean? Like, about? it doesn't need to be like, I don't know. I think maybe concepts that are a little more um, utopians in a way. <laughs> I don't know. It's just a very awful image to have a slaughterhouse in the school. Well, like, I mean, I've look, never I mean, look, seen the, like, the, like, the, like the, things the, being butchered. It's the, pretty awful. The punchline of that whole thing is the execution. But there's a lot of good for work before the final execution that makes sense, right? And I think is also another good example for critics, which we'll do another conversation about. On, um, you know, there's the there's the ideas and the execution, the premise, the research, the approach is there, right? But somewhere along the line, you probably took a very specific, you chose a very specific turn, a route to a dead end that is maybe a little bit too red, but. Up until that point, okay, yeah, there's actually some things happening. And it's far more interesting and far... I'll tell you what, if you were submitting a a, a, a school design for a conceptual uh, architecture competition, that, a school next to a slaughterhouse, and assuming it, it was in an appropriate kind of city and place, is a much better project than one that doesn't have any conceptual spine and says like, I have this number of classrooms because this is what it says in my research that we need the number of classrooms for this many students and we have daylight. That is not anything. Well, I mean, it's, it's more provocative and it, it's more innovative in a sense that it's never been done. If it makes it a better project, I, I, I don't know. Yeah, it is. It is. It has value. It has some kind of, because because someone is thinking about something somewhat differently that cause, it's, it's, it has more value. The other thing is just, it's, yeah, it's rudimentary it's as, math. Yeah, but like the actual ending proposal is as dangerous as, you I don't know. know it is. Uh, well, I mean, there's things that I haven't been thought of, obviously. Okay, maybe it's not maybe it's not a slaughterhouse. Like every... I would be freaking scared to hire that person to do maybe, any project. Maybe it's not, but but there are contexts where it it could be validated. Absolutely. Yeah, if it's it a school for farmers. Oh, or you know, I think I think the image everyone has is that there's slaughtering happening every day, but that could be not every day. It could no, be just on Fridays, just on you know, certain summer Fridays, certain you know evolution, progress, yeah. growth. Moon there's Monday. there's steps to right. the slaughtering. I'm sure maybe like right. just ahead today, Monday's like leg tomorrow. day. Well, what's your example of a project with a good concept? I don't know the High Line. The High Line. I don't know. The fuck? Did you say that High Line? You didn't say High Line. The High Line is barely a concept. The High Line know. is basically ninety-five percent successful because of what it was before. High Line is not a con. No, not a concept. Not a concept. The High Line is. I have a table. Okay. No one uses the table. Why? Uh, it's kind of old. I repair the table. Okay. What was People the example the table of a now. good build concept besides your crazy slaughterhouse one? So you don't seem very convinced by the uh, slaughterhouse example? Not your thing. It's because you don't like meat? You know, meat? it's like those... No, it's because you don't like it's meat. Just, it's, no, I, I eat some meat. No. But it, it's like any example is sh like flashy. Mm. It's just flashy to be flashy. And yeah, it's a fun I, and I example. Think it, it, it's, yeah, but the thing is it's it's losing its, its main focus of what that example was meant for because it's flashy. And that just kind of bothers me. Well, no, no, me. no. But, 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 but the, the point is, is that it, it's meant to get you to a place where, on the face of it, as I said, you would totally reject that idea. So the exercise yeah. is about looking at something that makes no sense and saying, is there a logic behind it to where I could fall, f so, to, to where I could Yeah, get and the logic with. and the concept of like teaching kids about death, that's the valid concept, and I can get on board with that. But the realization of it is is like... Absurd. It's absurd, but let me ask you: Does it work? Uh, well, yeah, it works. If okay, you show, if there, you show things being the killed, answer. Uh, the there's concept the of life and death is pretty damn clear. There's the answer. There's the answer. But but is that is that enough? Like is that all? Well, you know, maybe there are other more nuanced things that need to be taught. So you can say, okay, initial design pitch, 
design or the architect interesting but one we got to dial it back two this makes me think that there's a whole process of life you know uh step stages through it you know growth evolution decline maybe that can be weaved into the narrative so it's not just life death right right okay so let's say you weave that into it and that's say also you expand it so it's not just animals being decapitated every day but now you have plants and other things okay legit project right so i think also but the slaughterhouse thing is is um is a good case study for uh the uh, a negative thing which is post rationalization oh like you came up with the idea now you're trying to justify it yeah yeah oh yeah and i mean and it's I a good like, exercise still and i feel like a lot of like concept sometimes like come like that yeah. like afterthoughts like oh yeah actually like here is a reason why i did this but really that was not why you did it the thing is if you can the way the presentation works and the ex explanation of the project and basically the valid what how the project or how a project gets validated is you go step by step by step right and with one step easily predictably uh, easily leads to the next and you understand the second step because it came from the first one right third to second or the everything other. is weaved together. and wherever you end up that's that's it yeah and maybe i don't like step one but if steps one through a hundred are right good job i mean that's a really difficult thing to do so that's the interesting journey you have to go on i think when you're designing and that's also i like the slaughterhouse example uh because it makes me laugh but also <laughs> It, it reminds me that you need to even though even though there's a the step-by-step -step kind of rationalization during the presentation of things um you the process is different from the presentation because the process is not one two three four five to a hundred right the process like i said is a squiggly line which means that you need to be open to these other random ideas who the fuck would think about a slaughterhouse when you're designing a school no one would right unless you have the right premise unless you say to yourself Okay, I want to think about life, death. I'm going to let my brain just float around. Okay, somehow end up at Slaughterhouse. You need, like I said, you need to be light-footed. Your brain needs to operate in that way. You need to float from things, from, from one program to the next. You cannot assume, you can't let preconceived notions of what the program is dictate your thinking in the process, right? No, that's fine, but that's part of the research steps. If the final proposal is the starter house in the school, there's a problem. You haven't Maybe. gone through the whole process. It needs to be refined, but you need that kind of distortion. And there have been plenty of architectures that incorporate totally random things that you would not think would work. And suddenly we realize there's chemistry and now we have something that's different and it works maybe as a one-off given the specific conditions of this environment, of this city, the people, the place. And maybe it also sets a precedent for entire new way of approaching this program or, or building type period and i think that's like uh you know essential in a way yeah and mixing programs actually uh, another i think kind of um you know people like it's it's a concept in itself right mm -hmm. like mixed use like combining things that at first don't seem like they relate to each other they could work together but they actually can then it makes it unique it makes it different and maybe something even will come out of these two worlds colliding in the same space right but oh, okay, but means. to me it's, it's yeah. it has to be more than that that's one part of the equation but you cannot well i think it's a means to an end mixing right. things yeah yeah but i feel like oftentimes like mixed use or like you oh, know you, uh, like combining so uses that are not related it's kind of a lazy way to okay. get a concept, mm -hmm. right? It's like a formal, it's like you have a formal gesture that's your concept while you have mixed use, that's my concept. Yeah, no, not it's, a concept. It, it's not, it's, it's a programmatic yeah. approach. It, it's not a concept. Yeah, right, right. And I think that's also where going back to abstract diagrams is super important because it, it strips away a lot of preconceived notions to kind of the, that's raw state and allows you to jump to other alternate realities right so uh if you think about i'm going to design a mug and you start the process by drawing that mug we have on the table which is a very standard i heart new york mug that we actually have on the table right well there are limitations with that right you you've 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 put all these all these constraints on it but if you take a step kind of like before the realization of that mug and you say what is a mug well 
at its basis basic level a mug is a device that holds liquid uh, that you can hold in your hand and it's usually to hold hot liquid okay well that opens the doors to all kinds of different shapes and all kinds of random things I think you need to strip stuff away to that level so that going back to the school you know strip the school down to what it, what is it about educating students about life in this case in this in the particular narrative that I came up with life and death and that that kind of understanding right that serves as a platform for me to then jump over to crazy things that on the face of it do not relate at all to the number of bathrooms we need the fact that we need a good playground stuff like that um so I think finding connections I, I think that's why I can I, I think when you when you think conceptually it allows you to find connections between different things that make no sense mm -hmm. and you can find that this one element that doesn't make any sense for this one actually went to, there together can have a certain effect that achieves these goals and if it achieves these goals and it's safe why is it not valid right I once was um designing a uh, this might be too I don't know how this is going to come across, but I was once designing a um, a chapel for Air Force veterans. So there's a community somewhere in the United States that was just for retired uh, Air Force. I mean, obviously, they're veterans. Air Force veterans that are older. It's like a, a, a like a what do you call it? Elderly uh, community. But it wasn't a building. It's a whole community. So they had like a lake, houses, mm -hmm. kind of a community center, and they wanted to build a chapel. The chapel was uh, non-specific to what do you call it? non denomin not not specific to any religion. Just kind of a you know spiritual gathering space. And I was wrestling with the questions that we've been talking about. Obviously, it needs to provide shelter. It was hot, so there needed to be shade. That they wanted outdoor space. There's all that kind of stuff. And for me, in the process, I was thinking, well, you're talking about a very specific group of people who, at one point, fucking flew in the sky. That's like a remarkable thing to experience that very few do, right? And there's a certain amount of freedom, I would presume, based on research and readings, that comes with that. Now they're grounded pretty much permanently. A lot of them can't move around, can't, or can barely function on the ground, right? So there's something about them being uh, not at ease and at unease in the society that they're in because they once experienced things and now that's in their past kind of thing. So I was wrestling with this and I was talking to a, a professor Actually, was not a professor, but this this architect, and I was saying that I I want them to feel a certain way as a result of this chapel, to experience certain certain things that would help them kind of maybe find relief from this narrative. The narrative being they were once up in the sky free, and now they're not, and they're stuck. Like I want that to be healed in some way, and I had and all these like ideas for buildings and whatever, and the. The question he asked, he asked me as his, as his advice, which is typical to this person, was what would happen if you, I don't, well, actually, I don't remember if he said it in, in, if it was in place of, of, of the building, but, or in addition to the building, but he said, what would happen if there was a graveyard for the people that, the, the Air Force veterans who passed away? What would that do? And then he walked away. And I was like, uh, what the fuck just happened? <laughs> like, like, what do you mean? What, what happens if there's a graveyard? Like, that's an absurd thing. Like, that's the total opposite of what I'm trying to do. And also, it's not a building. Immediately, I'm like, well, there's no shelter. There's no indoor. There's no. There's no all these things. Like, there's a bunch of, I presume, things sticking out of the ground. So, like, how do you gather? And I actually never got the answer from him. But, but I thought about it for a number of weeks, and um, in some ways, I felt like, well, actually, maybe. A graveyard would be a very appropriate thing for this community because it's a way to kind of end the process and for them to come to realization that there is an end and there are these people that they were close with before that are there and it kind of creates a it, it's almost like it forces you to con the, the people to confront the fear of death the fear of the end and therefore make their current time at the community um less uneasy i mean i guess i mean it's pretty dark still it's like it's pretty i mean I, at the end you're still gonna die bobby so you might as well just enjoy like the green lawn with your friend right now because you don't have much longer you know like it's, yeah 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 i mean i mean i think it's easy to 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 look at that and see the potential uh negatives to it but 
I think the psychology uh, and the research of it would prove also that there's actually deep benefits to having to recognize the rally situation that they all know that they're within. It's almost like it sets, it resets the tone and the context within which they're operating um, because the thing that everyone fears and presumes as the end is is like, it's just it's just there all the time and part of it, right? Anyway, I guess I don't my, know. My only point is, is that there is a certain way of thinking, I think, in design when you start to um, inject or copy and paste or think about other elements, spaces that have nothing to do with what you're trying to tackle. And you think about how, what effect would they have on people in this context of my project, right? And maybe they need to get to, they need to get adapted in a certain way, right? You can't just copy and paste things. A lot of times it doesn't work. So maybe they need to get, get adapted or evolve. But that kind of thinking, I think, can be very productive. Right. Like, I mean, really, it's it's fundamentally how you question. It's it's one way of questioning any space that exists anyway, right? A dining hall, or or a hallway rather, hallway becomes an art gallery. Hallway becomes a a, a transitional space with a. Uh, side gathering pockets for gathering hallway becomes a shaft of light hallway becomes this hallway becomes that right whatever definition of the thing is when you start to think about it as something completely different i think that's when it can be productive but it's that is conceptual thinking i think it's forcing yourself to find ties between these things that don't on the face of it make right, any sense at all right, right. you know and it's the same thing as in the research this group of group of people, percentage group of people, and this, this, I don't know, whatever else, how do these things relate? There's something there that makes these things to these thing, these two things relate to each other. Right. Um, you know, I'm designing a park. Well, there are a lot of obvious things you think a park would have, but perhaps there's a missing piece to the puzzle here. And that produces a new program that Park should have. I'll give you another example real quick. One of the projects that one of my students did, which I, I actually thought was really interesting, uh, he was tasked with designing a park, a uh, big park. And again, oh, trees, bike paths, everyone likes to bike now, scooter paths, you know, Check whatever. Off the list. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And he found in his research that there were a number of schools in the vicinity, really close by actually, and none of the schools had playgrounds. So he had this idea, they and there's had, a lot of- They like, had slaughterhouses. <laughs> they had slaughterhouses. I was like, see, it happened. But, um, Bring and the, the playground. There's logistical problems with this proposal, but I don't really care. Um, so his idea was then to have the playground swap from being public to, call it private, but public to school private. So during certain times of the day, it would be public as it would be in a normal park, used for gatherings and communities and things like this, uh, community gatherings and stuff. At other times, it would be private and only usable to this to the to the students, to the kids, effectively operating as their playground. That is an interesting idea, and that's one that only comes about if you do the if you do proper research. It's only one that comes about if you start to make connection. Actually, that's a fairly obvious connection in a way. Now that I say it, but I tell you what, not everyone came across that. You know, it's not an immediate direction you would think of. Why don't you rarely also think of spaces as um, having multiple identities, yeah. multiple faces, right? You oftentimes just attribute a face to a space and that's that's all it's going to be, right? But allowing that kind of duplicity of relationship is interesting. Yeah, and I don't know if actually I would call that a concept. That's more of a specific solution to a very specific problem, but for sure it validates the project incredibly. Um, I think, I think in that particular one, the way it played out, that, that there was more conceptual thinking, thinking that needed to happen. So as I described it, I wouldn't say that's very conceptual, but I think there is a kind of uh, the conceptual portion that didn't quite make its way into the project had more to do with the negotiation of boundaries. And I think kind of awareness of people or something. There's something else there that well, had there to do with... there is some like social, you know, programmatic aspects and that is pretty, pretty strong. And I, I mean, you know, a, a, a concept that could be applied to the multiple layers of a project 
might be coming from one of those layers more or less mm -hmm. right and it's fine that as long as it could be applied to all of the layers meaning like if the concept is mostly socio-economical or something that's fine as long as it ties back into like design and spaces and like other things right well yeah i mean in that particular one like how do you outline one space or the other and how does how do those outlines change over time right by day of the week, by hour or whatever, becomes a very interesting problem to solve if you were to Design -wise, create yeah. it into an architecture, yeah. right, that has some kind of visual effect for X, Y, and Z reasons. Um, so, I don't know, in the end, do you need a concept? I, I think it's a good thing to strive for, but I think probably more... What an, um... I was going to say, maybe more important is that you just have a really robust, you know, and deep understanding of the problem, and then you have an answer that addresses that problem and maybe if you go through that process correctly you will have a concept by I default think, i think to me is like you have to aim for more than what you've been asked to do and the concept might be more because no one's asking you for a concept really and then the other question is do people who use the building are in the building need to know about the concept well, besides experiencing it, like it's just can they just get it by experiencing it? Do they have to know about it? Does it matter if they know about it? Know about it, it or be what do you mean by know about it? Like actually know about it? Like consciously know? Oh, the concept know? was banana. Oh, I've never realized the concept was banana. Now I'm going to see it differently. Or, oh, I think that building, the concept was banana. Like I just feel like it was banana. <laughs> right? This shit's bananas, man. <laughs> no, it's marshmallow. <laughs> um, you so know, the question like, is, do they, do they need to know? Do they need to know? And I think if a building is successful and its concept is successful, then no one needs to know there is even a, a concept. Does that make sense? I mean, that's a good question. Let me look at my notes here. And basically, is the concept then just... Uh, just well, the, the 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 way the process for the architect to get to the successful end mm -hmm. like does the concept matter to anyone else but the architect at the end does well, they, anyone well, need to know that there is a concept well I, okay so first of all i think in terms of uh, of of the users of the general public knowing understanding being conscious of it recognizing its value is is a whole other thing it's it's like they're not going to. It's just not going to work. It, it's just not going to happen because they're not. That's not their job. It's to learn how to. I mean, think about it. The, the architect's job is to take the, these non-architectural things and translate into architecture, and then therefore an architect is also trained to look at an architect piece of architecture and work backwards. And as you're trained to do that, I don't know how the fuck you're going to understand what's going on at a deep level, um, unless you're talking about again, like giant broad brushstroke conceptual project ideas that are really obvious um which again a lot of times i question i question their validity because it seems like they didn't go deep enough um so i as i answer your question i i don't know if it if they need to i don't even i don't think they're gonna you know and in a lot of cases i don't think it means it's less valid i do think though that if the I don't know, actually. Maybe, I think it could be that in projects, when the concept is realized in a more explicit way uh, for architects and for non-architects, that could be a sign. That could be a sign that it actually it's a good project. It could be. Because other people can get it? Well, it would be that it's a good project because uh, it then, then, therefore, you would assume that it is expressing what it's trying to express, period, in terms of architectural critique. And also, maybe you would also, yeah, maybe you would say that if this building helps educate other people and realize the problems at hand and the the issues that the architecture is highlighting and potentially addressing or solving, then that is a much more potent building than one that does it tacitly. Yeah. Okay. Sure. I could see that, but that's really <laughs> just convince yourself. But, that, but that's really difficult to do, and I I think like I, I'm obviously thinking about my own work and other people's work, but I think that that's that's difficult to do in a lot of buildings, like proper buildings. When you get to closer to urban design, 
easier to do, uh, I think. I think, yeah. Because... Because... I think a lot of times urban design is maybe more about tactics and strategies and employing those correctly to achieve certain results. And a lot of times the results that you're talking about are more people focused and therefore what they're trying to achieve and the problems at hand are more explicit to people. Right. Oh, I think the opposite. I feel like urban design is more of the invisible thing. And that you could see things even more and more clearly in architecture because it's like one building is right there. I could see that. I mean, maybe the distinction between architecture and urban design is again not one we should make. But for what I was saying is, I think for for most buildings in architecture, it, it's it's a game of translating or um, not translating, decipher. Is it a, it's a, a, dis, a deciphering? Is that? I'm, high, I'm tired. Deciphering? <laughs> is that I it? I don't know. When you decipher something, is it deciphering? I do it not must know be. that word. <laughs> you don't don't decipher? Me. It means to, like, you decipher a a, a, a code, right? The De decoding? Sure. But that's decipher, yeah. <laughs> uh, um, you, you're deciphering an architecture, right? There's a legend, but you have, to, you have to know how to read architecture to understand what it's trying to do. Dissecting? No, no, no. no. It's deciphering. It's fine. D you, have to re you, have to, you have to know how to read an architecture to understand what it's trying to do or say. You have to read the detailing, the materials, the seams, and all that stuff. That's a more specific thing. But it, when it comes to generally urban spaces and, ur and urban design, it's a little more like straightforward, I feel. Um, so how about it might be so massive and it's... It might be invisible, but it's still more straightforward to the, to the average person when they see it. I still think the opposite. <laughs> How is that? How is that the case? Because you don't really see urban design. Like it's just, I don't know. It's 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 not as prominent in your face as like a building, a seam, a detail, a material, a surface. Buildings are things that people can understand. Urban design people don't really. People don't understand buildings. Don't. Well, but no, but in like in uh, okay, they don't understand it the way we understand it, that's, but they understand things and components of it to uh, to a certain level. Yeah. Urban design. People wouldn't even know how to describe urban design. But but I but I I think they they understand it more in terms of the social effect than than architecture, because public spaces. Oh, I mean, a know, bad sidewalk, a big street that has no pedestrian, that has no light. Sure, like they can under understand it in some ways, but it's limited. I don't know. Uh, I don't even know what the question is anymore. <laughs> We're where the question is, you know, whether you are asking whether or not uh, the concept of a building or an architecture or a space needs to be explicit so that people understand it, the users understand it. Yeah, and and I don't think you do. I think if you need to explain it or tell people, you fail basically. Oh, so you think it does need to be that explicit? Uh, I think it needs to be communicating itself without you having to explain it to people. But you're, but but the difference is 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 one of the effect it has on people versus them knowing that it's having an effect and knowing why it has an effect, right? Right. I don't know. We're getting very abstract here. I don't feel comfortable. Or <laughs> 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 so this is all in English. Like you don't That's even true. know what's coming, you going on know. up here. Uh, how do you say concept in French? Concept. <laughs> oh God. Yeah, but the conceptual thinking... French are thinking, so lazy, you just copy the The conceptual Americans. thinking... You know, conceptual thinking is something else. Like, you're trained in a... And I'm not finding excuses for myself, or maybe I am. Um, but you're trained in a certain language and, and, and gymnastics of your brain. And you're, like, muscled that muscle up in another language. It's really not easy. No, no, it's, it's really not it's, easy. It's totally true. And it, it's you're, you're, you're thinking of in, in a space where things don't exist and you're allowing stuff to be flexible. Like I was saying, you're looking, you're looking at existing things and you're trying to completely break them apart into bits and letting them float around in your head so you can find connections. It's chaos. That's why you have to write stuff down. You know, that's why you I think... You said that like you know how to speak multiple languages. Mo what? You're talking about multiple languages? Yeah. You're like, oh yeah, it's like that, it's like that. No, I'm but like, I, thought, I, thought, I, thought, I thought you were talking about <laughs> conceptual thinking in general. Well, in, oh. in, in general, but also in multiple languages. You know, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't pretend <laughs> to understand what that means. But conceptual is the no, thinking, period. No, it is period. a shit show. It's a shit show. You need to put stuff down, and that's the biggest problem. I think most 
offices or just designers when they're working with each other have they say all the stuff but don't fucking write it down and you know it, it's and and actually the you're right to bring that up because the methodology of the research and like the 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 techniques and the methods and the way you are going to try and get through that process when is you I don't know, when you're first year and you you start doing that you don't know which one you feel more comfortable with right which tools if it's in your brain if it's talking if it's writing if it's sketching making models right like reading like mm. it's just you kind of have to find ways that maybe over the years you're going to find yourself more comfortable in yeah. right and then you know that maybe that's the ways you're going to start with your your research process but keep it open. You might like start painting, and that might reveal some stuff. Who knows, right? You have to. Experiment, I think you have to. I think you have to find your 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 realm of comfort in the methods that you're using. But you also have to be extremely open, and like you said, being experimental and taking risk because sometimes it pays off. I will say for. 99.999999% of the population who are trying to be designers, who are designers, you the, the one thing that you do need to do is you need to write things down or say them out loud. Because language is a different way of thinking than, gra than, than graphic illustrations. Right. Illustrations allow us to lie and cheat and... and and we, we look at an illustration and we communicate to another human being via words, right? That's the translation that happens when we look at a drawing and we talk about it. But if the ideas of a project only exist as illustrations and they're never written down, you're not actually testing them in the way they need to be tested. In other words, it's very simple to look at a drawing, say a bunch of cool stuff, and then someone say, okay, yeah, I kind of get what you're saying, and then we read into it, and then it's good. It's just a cop-out, really, in terms of criticism, and it's a cop-out in terms of the design process and creating good design, right? I'm not saying that you only write to solve problems you have to do both but it's another testing it's 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 a really it's a testing ground that you can't avoid and it's almost like the ultimate testing ground it also works into writing skills which you need to develop i think your communication skills in that way well and writing leads into talking and speaking right yeah. and like if you do a diagram you should be able to explain it to somebody that's why you know like through architecture school it's such a big pain in the butt to do presentation because you basically have to go every through every single thing that's on the wall and explain why it's on the wall and what it is and it is you know kind of annoying and sometimes it's, it's difficult and it doesn't make sense and sometimes you don't want to talk about those things but it is important that you do and you learn how to talk about them because it's one baby step through the next step right and you can't you don't really want to miss that because it's it's a thinking process yeah yeah and it's a way to be um it's yeah i i think well we will have to do uh, another another one of these sketches about presentations and critiques but i think those four steps to be made but also in terms of again physically writing things down it's a way to get organized it's it's too confusing otherwise but i mean it's actually kind of kind of silly when you think about it designers struggle so much with the brainstorming process and coming up with ideas and like i don't know what i'm doing there's so many things or whatever like okay did you try to be more organized in what you're doing no okay well maybe you do that <laughs> did you write it down no no not yet okay well write it down next week <laughs> i'm so confused did you write any of your things down no i'm so confused yeah because you didn't write it down right i mean it, design is very parallel to writing a paper uh, and a lot of people don't know how to write but but you have a brainstorm process you need to put things down on paper you can't just unless you're frank lord Wright or whoever you can't just be thinking about stuff and then sit down and plan to write the entire story entire book from the first word to the last word in order fuck no there's a whole process to it right and one of the first things that happens too in terms of structuring is you create an outline you write your shit down, you create an outline to know what's big and small, what's important and not important, right? You never do that. <laughs> um, when you write, I do you never actually, do yeah. it. Oh, no, I do. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. But my outlines you are get, just, you know, really You get lost in the details. <laughs> I mean, there's, a, there's a back and forth. You can't be structured no, throughout the entire right, process. No, but you're right. You're right. You're, you're, you, first, you gather all your data, all your characters, your, your moods, your elements, your atmospheres, your proof, right? Your detective <clears> work, right? Then you put strings in between... And then you start writing like what ties people together and then you have your outline and then you just start developing it. If you're stuck with trying to propose something, don't propose anything. Just take the things you've written down that you've researched, the, the things that are like already there, we could say, and try to translate those into diagrams 
or try to analyze the built environment of those things to understand why they work, right? One, to get the ball rolling, and also because that is that is itself in itself education for you for future projects, and certainly for this project. It's going to inform and help you get somewhere. And I feel like that's uh, something that a lot of students uh, in architecture struggle with, right? It's like they get kind of like focused on the actual creative step Mm -hmm. And they want to get to that point before they actually did step one, which is research, right? Research, analysis, understanding, like detective work. And I feel like a lot of them don't think it's necessary because they're good enough that they could come up with like some cool ideas. But at the end of the day, it's not about coming up with the cool idea. It's coming up with the right idea for mm -hmm. the project. Or they're afraid. They're afraid because they and don't want to... And they're not that good. They're still in school, you know, yeah. and you have to just be hum be humble and accept that there's certain things you should probably be looking at because why not? You know, it's right there. Yeah, I think there's that. And I think it's also because there's the fear. You don't, there's a fear of like doing a project that's going to be some super lame thing that's super basic. But, and there is a the fear those of are, time and you have just... to like, you know, come up with an idea, have time to develop it, have fun. They want to start having fun before understanding right. where they should have fun. Right. But that's but that's what I'm saying though is that is that to make those distinctions is incorrect because that means you're approaching the research process incorrectly. Right. The research process is conceptual. It is fun. It is an exercise in design. That is uh, actually that's uh, I can't say anybody. The research process is an exercise in design. You can't divorce the two, right? That's where you end up like we we're saying with people who do random banana stuff and people who do things that are like fucking lame, yeah. right? Because you're not actually using your design thinking throughout. The entire your conceptual thinking rather right, throughout right, the right. Design, entire design process okay everybody we are going to end it look if you like what we're doing what the fuck leave us a review go <laughs> go go on itunes and leave us a review uh because what? we appreciate you them us a review? and it would help us a lot uh yeah log in make it make an id if you don't have one and just you know leave us a review and then you get good karma points uh, if you want to listen to the other episodes, we have a website, midnightshred.com. We are also on iTunes. Please subscribe if you like the show. On Spotify, I believe you can follow us on there. Uh, we are also on all or most of the social media platforms, uh, such as Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. We also have the YouTube channel. You can subscribe. Uh, leave us some comments on like specific episodes you've listened to if you have any questions. And we have an email address on the website. The email is hello at midnightchorette.com. The website is midnightchorette.com. And finally, best for last, the hotline. Yeah. Introduced by David. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Terrible outro. Okay. The hotline is 213-222-6950. Call or text. Reach out to us through that or any of the other ways and uh, to let us know what you think. Any comments about this recording, any feedback, any thoughts you have about concepts and architecture, suggestions for other things we should cover, suggestions for guests, uh, that would be good too. And apart from that, we thank you for listening. It means a lot. And um, we will talk to you again next week or sooner, right? Yes. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye.